All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by John Newenberg, who is up in Vancouver in Canada, up the coast. <laughs> nice, to, uh, nice to be here. And it's also sunny here, which is not all that common in October. <laughs> Excellent. Good, good, good. And uh, John has been a professional business coach since 2004, working with well over 250 clients. And uh, in 2019, you were awarded Canada's CEO Trusted Advisor Award in the small business category. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today is challenges facing uh, small businesses. And I think, John, to kick it off, I mean, it's, it's one of those things I think today is there are so many opportunities for small business that they never had before because of you know, the the internet now with AI, with outsourcing through you know Upwork and being able to you know there's a lot there's there's a lot there's a lot of things going in your favor, but there's still a lot of challenges that go with it. So what do you see? Uh, what are the enduring challenges that are always there, um, and what are some of the ones that are are maybe a little newer? So. The ones that most, I most commonly see uh, in the kind of business owners I work with, and they're usually something like 500,000 in revenue up to maybe 5 million in revenue, mm -hmm. give or take a little. Um, those business owners are always complaining about time, team, or money. So they're saying things like, I've got too much to do. I can't get everything done. If I don't do it, it won't get done. Mm -hmm. well, when it comes to team, it's really recruiting is very difficult these days. Getting good team members, getting them to do the work at the quality you need, getting the culture you want. And money has two aspects to it. One is having uh, proper accounting, financials, reporting, KPIs, a dashboard, a way to measure results. And the other side of money is I need more money. I need better sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are pretty universal for the clients that I work with. And um, just in, in in reverse order there for a moment, uh, just looking at the, the the money factor, because I think that is probably the thing that undermines a lot of small businesses and startup businesses is that is that not giving yourself enough capital runway and not understanding cash flow, you know, not understanding cash flow, because, you know, often I can it's great. Maybe you sold a hundred thousand to, you know, in revenue this month, but it doesn't mean any of these people are going to pay you anytime soon, or maybe they'll pay you later and all of that. And that, and running out of runway with liquidity, I think is that something that, that really faces a lot of people because we underestimate often, or we're over optimistic about uh, how long it's going to take to break even or be profitable. Or even, as I said, kind of overlook the fact that, yeah, it's great to sell, but if you can't collect, <laughs> Yes, that's a common misunderstanding amongst business owners is I my accountant tells me I'm profitable, <laughs> but I don't have any money in the bank. How is that possible? And uh, so, um, so business owners typically aren't thinking in terms or don't have a resource around helping them do cash flow forecasts. So they tend to kind of operate out of what I call their hip pocket. You know, I've got money in the bank. I'll buy a truck and my things must be good. And yep. then wonder why they can't make the bills next week. And uh, the other thing that can happen is they can see themselves, you know, sales are growing, sales are increasing, and yet more and more and more they're having difficulty financing that. And again, it's because they don't know how money works in a business. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing called a cash gap. And the cash gap is that space and time between having paid payroll yep. and the inventory and those kinds of things and collecting on those sales, and that could be 30, 45, 60 days. And as you grow that cash gap, that working capital needs grow so much that you're running out of money and you're profitable and sales are going up. How did this happen? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And the other thing too is, and people sometimes think that, oh, well, if I'm a small business, if I'm selling to a bigger business, well, you know, that's good. They'll, they'll be able to pay because they have the money. And it's often the bigger businesses that squeeze the smaller businesses because they go, yeah, you can't come after me, so I'll push you off to 60 or 90 days. I don't care about you. They, they do because they, they're, they you know, um, sort of taking advantage of the cash gap because they want to extend terms so that they have the money in their own coffers. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, um, they can afford to do it. 
Yeah. And then you mentioned you mentioned team and, and recruiting, right? And and I think that's another really interesting thing because as I said, in some ways you have access today to more more resources across the globe and you can find them you can find them you know cheaply and highly qualified by the way uh but you have to know how to manage that but if you need physical if you need physical employees you know in a local business or whatever how, how do you find them because it's it's like it is amazing to see all of these even retail businesses with like one or two people i mean there was yeah. one the other day talking to the people and they said once upon a time they had eight people working every day now they have two yeah so recruiting is very difficult um you know if we think back to a time say the last time we really had a recession 2008 9 10 um, getting customers was very difficult and we worked very hard at it today in our environment we have most business owners are complaining they have more work than they can handle Mm -hmm. um, and don't have enough people to deliver the service they're talking about. And yet when it comes to recruiting, they try to do it off the side of their desk. You know, it's sort of an afterthought. Oh, crap. I'll just post an, another one of 25 ads on Indeed that all look the same. And then they wonder why they don't get results. Today, recruiting is the tougher of the two things to solve. If you think of I got to get customers and I got to be able to deliver Getting customers is relatively easy. Delivering your service, especially as you say, if you need people on the ground, boots on the ground, people doing the work locally, that's the harder of the two things. And we tend not to give it the attention, the resources, the creativity that mm -hmm. these circumstances require. Yeah. So uh, how do you, how do you help advise people on that? Because one of the other things that has become very prevalent now is the expectation levels of, of people about what they can earn and how quickly they can earn it and all of that. I mean, this is a common thread across. I talk to lots of parents and, you know, they even talk about their kids now, you know, they have crazy expectations of what they need to have by the time they're 21 or whatever. So I can imagine <laughs> recruiting people is getting harder because there's an expectation gap. Yeah, there is an expectation gap. And the, the, you know, the leverage is tilted in, the, in, yep. in favor of someone looking for work and get, you know, like literally five offers in two weeks. Um, and so they can, you know, if there's anything that today annoys them, they can walk across the street tomorrow and get a new job. And so uh, business owners tend to, you know, walk on eggshells when when uh, working with their team because they're so afraid of doing something that causes them to, uh, to go. So there is, you know, entitlement is one of those things, but just simply the environment is such that uh, uh, em employees or team members have lots of leverage and that they have lots of choices. They have lots of options. And uh, um, and so what I'd say is that most business owners, when they think of marketing, they'd get organized, have it, you know, at some level, sophisticated marketing and selling process. But when it comes to recruiting, uh, they don't put anything behind it. There aren't any resources. You talked about, as an example, uh, Upwork. Gosh, you can get you know really good recruiters on Upwork, capable, skilled people who will do that kind of work for you for 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour. You, yeah. Why not have an HR department? Why not make that the primary focus or where you put some energy in your business? The other thing I'd say is that um, most today, all business owners ought to be recruiting every day, uh, continuously. And what I mean by that is that at any given time, if one of your team members were to leave, my counsel to you would be that you know the five people you would talk to that, uh, that would be a replacement for the person that's just left the business and that you've been engaging with them, you know, maybe having a coffee or exchanging some ideas on social media somehow, but that you've got a relationship um, so that you have, in a sense, like a bench. Right. A, a backup team that at any given time, if something happens in any of the key jobs in your business, you already know who uh, potential replacements might be so that you think about, uh, you know, uh, recruiting as a, a significant endeavor in your business and you put the energy and effort that it, the current circumstances require.
Mm -hmm. and, and one of the other things, uh, John, I think is interesting is I, I, I think some people still can't wrap their head around the concept of fractional resources or part time oh. resources or that. And that they always think that a warm body is better, like having a full time warm body, because maybe I recruit you to do one thing, John. But then I discover that's actually not a full time job. So I start getting you to do other things that you're actually not qualified to do. Absolutely. And you're probably not going to do very well. Um, but I feel like I have to fill up your time instead of going, OK, I need to look at these as discrete things that need to get done. And maybe I need discrete resources to do them because it's a specificity of the job. You know, that's the blog post I put out today. Went oh, really? To this, this exact topic that you need a backup for the backup. You mm -hmm. need people to be cross-trained. And instead of having one full-timer who, if that person were to quit, you'd be over a barrel, why not have three part-timers who overlap to some extent, but at any given time, if one leaves, you're still okay. Um, the other thing you're referring to is there's fantastic resources available on uh, to do most of, you know, the office or admin or support activities that a business typically needs. And in my case, I've got probably, I'm going to say a team of 12 or 15 people who are on call, if I can put it that way, yep. freelance on Upwork to do various things that the business needs. Yeah, and 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 the and the beauty of that, as you said, is you can get somebody who's an expert in a particular area. Exactly. And 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 I think that's the beauty of it. And the other thing you started off, you mentioned was the time, the time factor. Sure. And yeah. this is something. And I apologize to my audience for repeating myself ad nauseum. But uh, today, you know, today people are always saying, "Oh, John, I'm busier than ever. I've never been as busy in my whole life." And I'm always like, "But are you really, or is it that you're more distracted and more scattered than you've ever?" been in your life because we are interrupted all the time by text by this by by that we don't focus we believe that we can multitask which i don't believe we actually really can i think it's doing a lot of things badly at the same time but um but this whole awesome. thing of time yeah so there's a lot of pieces that tease apart there but you talk about multitasking our brain literally cannot multitask yeah. what we actually do our brain has a single processor so what we describe as multitasking is actually switch tasking. Mm -hmm. And the act of switching has an overhead to it, has, yep. a, has a, a cost to your productivity. So when you're multitasking, you're actually decreasing your productivity effectiveness. You're not actually adding to it. Um, the other thing that you said about being distracted is that we allow others to steal our time, to take our time and, and have us operate on their agendas and instead of ours. So uh, anyone who's effective ought to be working with a default diary or sometimes known as time blocking. And uh, in short, what that is, is that uh, in any given week, you know what that week's or quarter's uh, results, the most important results that you need to get. What activity, what do you do to get that result? How much of that activity? And then how do you map your time for the week so that it matches those priorities? Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that, that gives you the, the courage, the inner strength, the ability to say no. In fact, yeah. focus isn't what you say yes to, Steve Jobs. It's what you say no to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 80, 90 percent, if there's ever an application of the 80, 20 rule, uh, 80, 90 percent of what occupies your time is a very low use of your time. In fact, what I'd encourage everyone on the call to do is a, a time audit. So uh, print out, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a sheet of some kind and keep a record of what you do during your working day in blocks of 15 minutes. You start at seven, you finished at seven. What did you do in every one of those 15 minute blocks? Do that for five days. And then at the end of it, uh, put yourself, give yourself a skill fun box. So that's a two by two quadrant. Uh, and on one axis is skill, on the other axis is fun or productivity or uh, the things that you do that right. generate the most income. In the upper right, your time, most of our time, you as the business owner, your time in that upper right, when you're doing the most uh, productive things in your business, your time might be worth two, three, five hundred dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. If you do this time audit, I promise you can find five, seven, nine hours worth of work that belongs in that low left, low skill, low fun quadrant that you're currently doing. Or I'll give you a hack. Anytime you say to yourself, oh, crap, I need to. Yeah. Blank, 
That <laughs> by definition is you telling yourself you shouldn't be the guy doing it. And when you go to Upwork and look for virtual assistant, there's somebody who'll do it better than you. Yeah, yeah. Better than you. And they'll do it for 10 bucks an hour. And for them, that's a fortune. Yeah. And they'll be happy to happy to do it. Yeah. I just wrote down something here. Yeah. the w A moment ago, we we're just talking about when, because I was talking to somebody the other day about this. It's, you know, that classic, do you have a minute? Right. And you go, yeah, of course I have a minute. And, and it may be, it may be an actual minute. It rarely is, but it may be an actual minute say, okay. Yeah. But because of the context switching, because now you've switched out from focusing exactly. on one thing to listen to that, it takes on average like 20 minutes or so to refocus. So that one minute, that didn't cost you one minute. That cost you 20 minutes. And imagine if you did that in a two hour span and you took three interruptions, how much right. of your productivity have you lost? Yeah. You literally have lost half your productivity. And you might challenge yourself about this, but the next time you take a disruption, mm -hmm. whether it's a minute or 10 minutes, Ask yourself or be conscious or aware of how long it takes to get back to what was I doing and what where exactly was I at and what was the level of focus and concentration. It takes about 20 minutes to get back to that yeah. spot. Yeah. And if you even go back to that spot, because you may actually on your little journey back to where you were actually get distracted into something else. And now you're suddenly doing something else and you're behind where you were before. So there, there's so many aspects to the focus. Yeah, you're, you're very, very right. Mm -hmm. um, and then just just in the last part, John, what do you think are some challenges that are coming up maybe that people on the horizon that may be new or maybe old challenges, but they're manifesting in new ways? I, I don't think people are recognizing the extent to which AI is going to change the way we do things. Um, if we think back to 25 years ago when Google started, and created an entire way to engage in the internet um, and took over from some of the, yep. you know, the older search engines back at, back then, how much of a revolution that was. Yep. We're on the cusp of another one just like that. And lots of people aren't uh, learning, experimenting, uh, figuring out how AI can help them. Um, yesterday I was working with a guy who's an HVAC contractor and he wanted to post a job, um, you know, on the on the yep. deed and other places like that. And he, I don't know where to start. How do you do a job post? So, uh, you know, just for fun, we went over to Chat GPT. Uh, what's the job post you would use for HVAC technician? And you know, ninety seconds later, there it was, mm -hmm. and it was far more complete than any of either of us would have done just simply on our on our own. And so he had. You know, this particular case, he had something that was 80% right within 90 seconds, and it, it would be easy in 10 minutes to kind of tweak it to make it relevant or personal to him. And so uh, if there's anything you want to figure out uh, what it is and how it works and how it applies to whatever it is you're doing, think about AI. It's um, if you're if you're the work you do requires boots on the ground, you're a tradesperson, etc. Yeah. It won't be quite. As significant, but if the work you do requires uh, some level of professional uh, advice, uh, pr professional consulting, um, it quite likely is going to revolutionize how we go to how mm. that business happens as we go forward. So, um, if you haven't already, uh, it's time to jump on and figure out what is AI and how does it apply to uh, to my world. Yeah, and 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 a part of that is like people's expectations are going to change because if you if you remember back when we learned how to search in in Google or or the other search engine, the original search engine back in Yahoo in the day, I mean we we learned how to search. You know, you know what you do for a search. You put in certain words and whatever. Uh, now with with AI, it's going to be much more natural language. It's much more of a conversation. It's much more exploratory and building upon. And so, if you can't if you can't accommodate that greater sense of ease and natural uh, interaction with your business, yeah, people are going to start noticing the difference. Very much, very much. Um, uh, getting the best out of AI is all about. Um, learning how to use prompts, learning how to engage AI so that it it uh, produces the best possible results for you. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe if you haven't already heard this, there was a uh, professor in the 
Pennsylvania University, I think, Philadelphia. Uh, and he was a law professor and he gave AI, this is six, eight, nine months ago. Oh, yeah. He gave him his law, his, his exam. And he, the grade, he, he said AI produced the result of 90%. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's there, it's coming. I mean, I really would encourage, and I think it can be a great boost to, to small business. Again, it can be somewhat of an equalizer if you, if you know how to use it. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, well, it, yeah, well, listen, John, this has been great. All of John's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do share with people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I'm a business coach and uh, I work with the business owners, you know, in the one to five million dollar space. They're usually either traits or craftspeople or they're professional advisors. So that means lawyers, accountants, health practitioners provide advice. Um the lawyer, the electrician, they're both really great at what they do, but they have never had a business education, never learned how to run a business. And I can't help you be a better lawyer, but I'll help you have a better law practice. Yeah. And and again, whenever I talk to a coach, I always say this uh, is that I guarantee, listen, everybody out there, I guarantee you spend money on a hobby of some kind. And you have no problem going out, like maybe you're a golfer, you have no problem going out and paying, you know, the golf pro at the at the golf club to give you a lesson. How much money do you spend on the thing that puts bread on your table? Do you ever hire a coach for that? So I would encourage you to go check out John's work. And uh, I'm very much encourage people look at a coach because again, why do you go to a coach for your hobby? Because it gets you better and it helps you and they have experience and insights and they can see things that you can't see. Awesome. Thanks for that. Of course. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, John. Thank you for watching and listening. I will see you all again very soon. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you.